What a great room. It is great to see everyone this morning. And thank you, Jen, for that very generous introduction uh, and for your leadership, uh, which is so important to the movement. I was really appreciative when John reached out to invite me to speak at the 2018 Just Economy Conference. I'm, I'm really, really glad to be here, and I'm especially grateful for the partnership of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, its member organizations, which you all represent, and all of you really in the room today, who champion everyday economic fairness and who create opportunities for everyone, all people in this country, to build wealth and to fulfill their lives. As some of you might know, uh, during the Community Reinvestment Act's infancy, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights actually joined the chorus of civil rights groups that were calling for the creation of a new organization. And it was one to act as a watchdog for the CRA and to make sure that it actually delivered on its promise. And the organization was eventually founded and it's known today as the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. And really, when you think about it, what remarkable foresight movement leaders had and what a remarkable impact you've had and made these last three decades. It's the cross-section of community and faith leaders, of advocates, of lawyers and bankers and researchers and business folks that are seated here today. To me, that's a real testament to the impact of the organization and the coalition. You're bringing necessary groups together for the common cause of equal opportunity and of dignity for everyone. I wanna thank you all for all of the work that you're doing to build vibrant and equitable communities in America. This should be a bipartisan issue. It should be an issue that does truly bring all stakeholders together in the way that I think is really represented in this room. So last week I had the great honor of traveling to Memphis for the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. And it was an overcast night, actually a, another stormy night, kind of coincidentally, uh, Tuesday night. And I say coincidentally because when Dr. King gave his last speech at the Mason Temple Church where, where I was Tuesday night, it was also a, a night of great storms. But on that night last week, I stood shoulder to shoulder in the packed pews of the Mason Temple Church. Uh, and this was just to see the bully pulpit, the literal bully pulpit where Dr. King stood the night before he was gunned down it was a very powerful and moving moment. And this, this was the speech, the famous mountaintop speech, which I would urge all of you to take 15 minutes this week if you haven't to actually reread it. But he told the congregation that night, something is happening in Memphis. Something is happening around the world. And that something was that people were organizing for justice. Men and women were mobilizing in the city's refusal, against the city's refusal to treat over 1,000 of Memphis's sanitation workers. They were refusing to treat them with dignity, to pay them a living wage, and to negotiate with them in a transparent, fair, and honest manner. And those same messages from the pulpit were echoed last Tuesday night as labor leaders and faith leaders and community leaders and civil rights leaders and members of the community gathered to say once more that the struggle for economic security and civil rights in this country have been inextricably bound. We cannot make progress on one front without pushing for progress on all fronts. And the following morning at a rally in downtown Memphis, I looked out over the legions of people that had gathered uh, on the lawn and felt really deeply moved by their commitment to Dr. King's dream 50 years later. The rally was in many ways much more than a commemoration. It was really a powerful call to action and one that I think we should all be determined to heed. Today, in a lot of ways, we're kind of in a unique moment to reflect on the past and really mobilize for the future. And it's a time to take stock both of how far we've come as a country, but also of how much more work there is left to do. It's a time to honor the wisdom that we've inherited and to nurture the new ideas to carry us forward. And because we've gathered here to envision a just economy, let's begin on a day that in many ways set the course of work for so many of us in the room. And that day, was the day that welcomed the enactment of the Fair Housing Act only one week after the tragic assassination of Dr. King. 
When President Lyndon Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act into law in 1968, he championed the legislation as a promise of the century, a promise that would be protected and enshrined into the law. And it was a promise to help make people in America more free and have more access to opportunity, to free to invest in their future, to choose the right school for their children, to pursue their dream home without fear of discrimination driving closed, uh, closing doors to opportunity, and to not have their zip codes define their destiny. And the Fair Housing Act was such an important achievement because of its dual purpose. It both sought to eliminate housing discrimination and to promote residentially integrated and diverse communities. And it also marked, as all of you know, the first time that the Fair Housing Act became the law and policy of the United States. So communities of color and immigrants and women and working class families and people with disabilities now had the full force of the government's protection, of the laws of the land behind them as they sought to access credit housing and economic mobility. And the promise of the Fair Housing Act, it took years to secure. And there's no question that today the work continues, but it remains unfulfilled as a promise. Before I joined the leadership conference, as Jen um, generously mentioned, I led the Justice Department Civil Rights Division, which had the responsibility and the mandate for enforcing the Fair Housing Act. And to put it simply, we were very, very, very busy. Decades after the monumental moment in the East Wing of the White House when President Johnson signed that hard-won legislation into law, there's no question that we continue to see bias and bigotry. And we continue to see people denied their right to live freely and have access to opportunity, free from discrimination. There's a lot of cases that stood out for me. It was a very active time at the Justice Department on these, on these issues. But I want to just mention one that to me really demonstrates the awful indignity that affected communities have been forced to endure. And that indignity was not an isolated experience. Every day in different towns and different states around the country, my colleagues and I saw similar acts of discrimination. And many of you are familiar with these issues uh, in your own work. But this case that I'm gonna talk about just takes us back to Memphis. It was following a joint investigation with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We found that a regional bank had engaged in patterns of redlining, predominantly uh, um, uh, African-American neighborhoods. And the case involved alleged discrimination at nearly every step of the lending process, from how the bank solicited applications to the discretion it gave loan officers uh, and underwriters to approve and price the loans. And the unchecked discretion had direct and dire consequences. The Civil Rights Division found that the bank denied loans to African-American applicants at much higher rates than it did white applicants. We also found that the bank charged African-American borrowers for home, more for home mortgages than it did white borrowers. Audio recording from, internal, from an internal meeting at the bank revealed some deep biases driving practices. It was during the meeting that one manager explained the bank's race bias denial policy and employees responded by making derogatory slurs about communities of color. That's not who we wanna be as a country and that's not an America as good as its ideals and it's also not legal. So the Civil Rights Division pursued the case and we ended up with a very important settlement and it was one of many settlements that came out uh, in, in where there were facts were similarly presented. It was under the terms of the settlement, the bank agreed to pay nearly $7 million to the individuals and neighborhoods who were harmed by their policies. And the bank agreed to invest at least $800,000 in improving community partnership efforts. And it agreed to pay a $3 million civil penalty. But that's not all. The settlement actually held the bank accountable through more than just dollars. It required the bank to amend its pricing and underwriting policies to develop new standards to ensure compliance with fair lending obligations, and to provide employees and leadership with training in fair lending. And the bank's senior officials were cooperative and engaged, and together we really determined fair solutions to move the bank and impacted neighborhoods forward. Outside of fair lending, the Civil Rights Division also vigorously worked to ensure that qualified borrowers, regardless of what they look like, where they came from, or what language they spoke, had equal access to credit cards. 
We also took action to level the playing field in auto lending, and we fought housing discrimination and brought more banks into underserved communities. And from the hallowed halls of our federal government, we said loud and clear that there is no place in our country for prejudice. But today, those same halls are quieter. And so I'm asking all of you in this room today to remain vigilant in your work. Because often, as you know, people have no way of understanding or seeing how they are being treated differently when they don't have access to the broader picture. They don't know, they can't see when they're being turned down or turned away for biased or illegal reasons. And my predecessor, Wade Henderson, warned against discrimination with a smile. As we know, the indignity of discrimination seeks to degrade people for their race and national origin and religion and gender and physical abilities. And the Fair Housing Act really acts as a shield for people when big bigotry rears its head. But while the plaintiffs saw justice in this Memphis case, uh, many people continue to experience or live in hostile situations. And they feel like it's their only choice to stay or be forced to live on the street and sometimes with their children. But these cases, I think, tell us something important that most of you in the room already know. And it's just a truth that bears repeating time and again. Where we live matters. Where we live matters because where is inextricably linked to what is possible in this country. Will you or your family have access to safe drinking water? Will your son be stopped and frisked? Will you find a job that brings you purpose and pays you fair and decent wages? Will your local schools have textbooks for every child and heat? Will you have to worry about your family's safety? Will you need to travel more blocks or will you need to travel miles to reach the nearest grocery store? In this country, we practice justice by geography. And for some, that means that there's nearly nowhere to go for opportunity, and that is not okay. I'm sure that most of you in this room read what was, I thought was a very powerful editorial in the Sunday New York Times this past week titled, America's Federally Financed Ghettos, because we need to remember the role that the federal government itself played in perpetuating uh, segregation and, and unequal opportunity. That article explored the profound disparities in the accumulation of wealth in America and how lack of access to home ownership is one cause of the crisis. And the editorial cites a Harvard study that found that changing the circumstances for families who are low income can be crucial to breaking the cycle of intergenerational poverty. But over our country's long history, through a series of harmful laws and policies, the United States has built metaphorical fences around impoverished neighborhoods, locking people out of opportunity. And it wasn't just on race lines, though of course the history of racial subjugation in this country is clear. This affected a lot of different communities across racial lines. But again, this isn't who we wanna be as a country and this is not as good as America's ideals. It doesn't have to be this way. And it's why I'm so actually grateful to be joining all of you in the room today. Because you believe in something better. You believe that when one family thrives, all of us are better. You believe that the only road forward is really the road to justice and to dignity and the road to prosperity and opportunity. And that really gives me hope. And I also have hope because so many communities are joining forces today to protect the Community Reinvestment Act. Last week, the Treasury Department released its plans to, quote, modernize and improve this important legislation. And now I know there's been a lot of back and forth about whether the recommend recommendations bring us backwards or to a better place. But the bottom line is this. Access to credit is critical for economic mobility. And we're here today because we know that economic mobility is at the heart of the American dream. But for so many people in America, in the white working class and immigrant communities and communities of color, that dream is simply too remote. And the next rung on the ladder feels out of reach. And just consider what we're up against. So last month, the Trump administration requested to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census, which means participation in the census count could very well plummet. And there's a lot more that I can say about this, but that's not why I'm here today. But immigrants and people of color already living in hard to count communities face being written out of the allocation of key funding for services like schools and fire departments and hospitals. 
And we know that a lot of communities have been left out of and behind in our economy. But the answer cannot be to scapegoat immigrants or to blame immigrants for these woes. We have seen that playbook before. We have seen that playbook before, and it is not one that we should be returning to. But we know healthcare prices are on the rise. The cost of college and advanced degrees are going up, so much so that roughly one in four Americans right now is paying off student loans with a collective debt of $1.5 trillion. It's growing more expensive to put food on the table for our children and to care for our aging parents. And it's no wonder that families across America are feeling left behind. They feel burdened by finances and maybe even afraid of what is coming in the next week or month. What's, what is that gonna hold? But this crisis knows no race or religion, no color or creed, we are in this together. And that's why we will continue to fight together as a multiracial and diverse coalition. We have to fight to preserve the Community Reinvestment Act and we will fight to make meaningful improvements that foster security for all people even if they look and pray or live differently from our own families. Access to credit carves a path forward. It keeps hope alive and keeps us dreaming about the future and the legacy that we're gonna be able to leave behind for our children. And when the Community Reinvestment Act is working as it should, banks can help people begin to build equity and to, build, to buy a new car, to buy a new home, to start a business or open a local shop that feeds neighborhood renewal. And the Leadership Conference has been a longtime partner in this work. Almost a decade ago, then President and CEO of the Leadership Conference, Wade Henderson, gave testimony on the modernization of the Community Reinvestment Act. And he described how the law no longer reflected the realities of the day. It was, these were realities like changing technologies and the evolution of banking systems. And yet, despite living in a world of such dra drastic technological transformation, Wade observed that the conditions that prompted the passage of the CRA are still very much with us today. And he was right. But really, because of your advocacy and investment, because of the NCRC, because of John Taylor's leadership and all of this big, broad coalition in this room and outside, we are headed in the right direction, making progress. And we've seen extraordinary progress. In 2010, we passed the Dodd-Frank Act, not we, but uh, we helped push for it. And it created, as you all know, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And just like Senator Elizabeth Warren predicted, the Bureau didn't merely represent a reshuffling of enforcement authority. It represented a change in philosophy of how the financial industry should be regulated. And it gave borrowers a place that truly answers to them, not to powerful interests only. And though the Bureau faces pretty serious threats today, we are committed to repairing it for the future. And that's progress, and it happened because of you. When I was at the Justice Department in 2015, the Supreme Court ruled that disparate impact claims are legitimate under the Fair Housing Act. That deserves applause, I agree. It was not obvious that that would be the outcome, but the decision found that evidence can be used to show discriminatory effects of housing policies without having to prove intention. And Justice Kennedy noted in the majority opinion, he said, this permits plaintiffs to counteract unconscious prejudices and disguised animus. And that's progress. And that also happened because of you. And we're also seeing new and necessary attention to the intersection of justice reform and fair housing. This month is Second Chance Month. And in some states, when children are charged with certain offenses, their entire family could face eviction from affordable housing because of a child's court record. When adults are returning home from prison, they often face enormous barriers to access housing and employment because of their records too. And now our focus increasingly around the country is really from shifting from a, just a purely punitive model to making people and communities whole again and to give them second chances. And that's progress, and that is also happening because of you. And here in Washington, D.C., just down the street at the National Cathedral, Dr. King deliver, delivered his final Sunday sermon just days before his life was brutally ended. And he told the congregation, we are tied together in a single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. 
It's a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects all. And the work of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition really, to me, embodies these words. As you persist in seeking opportunities to build wealth and opportunity for people across this country, we all grow stronger. And as you continue to promote our equitable and transparent and diverse uh, transactions and neighborhoods, we all benefit because we are in this together. And after Dr. King was gunned down at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis 50 years ago, the Leadership Conference sent a memo to its members. It was a memo that, call, that called them to carry out Dr. King's dream. It asked our members, we are also a coalition, we are a coalition of over 200 national civil rights and human rights organizations. This memo asked our members to forge ahead through darkness, to concentrate on the coalition's legislative goals, and among them, at least a million jobs for the unemployed and decent low-cost housing for all. And 50 years after we lost Dr. King, I think we all carry that dream within us that promotes and perpetuates and fuels our work. And at the leadership conference, we know that the work of justice is hard and that it has always been uphill. We know that the road to equality and increased opportunity is long. But it only happens because people, like all of you in this room, struggle and strive to make this a reality. We know that together in coalition, we are called to be persistent in the march to realize America's ideals. It's a persistence that's really rooted in a commitment to our nation's highest values and the hope of what tomorrow may bring. And I'm just deeply honored to work with all of you, to know John Taylor, to know the NCRC, and to continue to struggle in that march with all of you. So thank you very much. I hope you have a great conference.